Greetings. Shalom, shalom. I am excited to present a demystification of the story of Dina. There has been so much revisionism concerning her story, so much reinterpretation and misinterpretation that has led, I believe, to a gross disrespect not only of Dina herself, but of our culture and our God. Many cite the story of Dina as one of the injustices in the Bible that our God allegedly allows and implies that due to the lack of sufficient or palatable resolution for this story that in its tragedy, it shows that our God has no compassion for women. This inaccuracy has led many to justify retreating and going astray into paganism, idolatry, witchcraft, African traditions, and the so-called conscious community. It is for Dina as an ancestress, as well as for our ancestral mothers whose stories have been erased or revised or left untold. It is for our women to understand the true nature of defilement and make distinction between forced violation and assault, which unfortunately many of us experience, as well as to clarify the ways we objectify ourselves and are complicit in our own debasement by agreeing to join with men who do not honor our culture and honor our inherent sacredness by giving us the respect of covenant marriage. This is to dispel the myths of feminism and destroy the demonic principality of the independent woman, the so-called sexually liberated woman, and to teach our daughters, our sisters, and ourselves that we, as the daughters of Yisrael, the daughters of Elohim, should never play the harlot. By understanding the consequences of sexual sin, soul ties, and sexual covenants made through immorality, as innocuous as our relationships may seem, we must fortify our nation and our community our people and our culture and honor our God by rejoicing in the ways he truly seeks to cover and protect us as women by staying within the safety of the boundaries of his laws and commandments that preserve our virtue, our innocence and our honor and indeed show how our God reveres and cherishes our femininity and seeks to preserve our sanctity and sacredness. So I shall begin. We understand that Dina, in her boldness to go out and venture to see the daughters of the city of Shechem, was likened to her mother, Leah. Why did she go out with her mother to see the daughters? And what was the reward of her going out? What was the reward for her curiosity and fascination with the idolatrous women in all their allure and entrancement? Was she met with the consequence to become like them? 
we shall see. Scripture tells us that Dina, the daughter of Leah, went out with boldness. She did not stay behind in her tent. And hearing the celebration of the women of the city dancing and reveling, went to study their ways. Little did she know, in God's mysterious ways of redemption, she would unwittingly introduce them to a God of righteousness through a covenant of blood. The story of Dina is easily one of the most controversial in the Bible. And as a woman, it is easily one of the most unfortunately misunderstood stories of a woman in the Bible that sadly has led many sisters to forsake the traditions of our ancestors and in bitterness and woundedness and lack of understanding, many sisters often use stories like Dina to misrepresent the word of our father and the traditions of our fathers and forsake the protective covering of Yah and the patriarchal order, again due to a wounded, embittered, and ignorant feminist spirit of rebellion, which is witchcraft. It is through the elucidation of the true meaning of these stories and through clarification from the true Hebraic, linguistic, cultural, and spiritual context that Yah's glory would be revealed and most of all his love for women to call his daughters back to him from the deceptions of the enemy that leads so many to the occult, to sexual immorality, to self-idolatry through sex worship and perversion in the illusion and delusion of what the world calls women's empowerment. So let's jump right in. The story of Dina is easily one of the most. Is the story of Dina a trigger warning? Does it merit its scandal and controversy? I believe the story of Dina as popularly perpetuated is an undeserved revisionism. And clarifying this story through its proper context does justice for Dina. The story of Dina may at first seem like a triggering, sensitive topic, a subject of outrage even. However, upon closer examination, we can see a great love story within. Within this often misinterpreted tale, we can see redemption and justice in surprising ways. It is not a Romeo and Juliet story per se, not a story of youthful and reckless star-crossed lovers exactly. However, this story is a story of covenant, soul ties, family honor, filial piety, and propriety. Ultimately, it is a story of salvation and restoration, justice and recompense, that manifests in strange and seemingly sordid ways. The central theme with which to ground our understanding of the story of Dina is understanding the distinction between entanglement versus covenant. We have Jada Piggott Smith to thank <laughs> for introducing the world to the term entanglement as referring to an illicit relationship outside of covenant. <laughs> what is the nature of defilement? What is the nature of obsession? What is love that persists in the face of degradation? 
Is there redemption in stories of the most dangerous type of willful blindness and idolatry? There's so much new discourse about the concept of soul ties, as well as spirit spouses, as well as the idea of twin flames. And I'd like to say that all of these things can be illustrated in one way or another in this very story. What will be uncovered is the truth of one of Satan's strategies for targeting the family unit, the covenant of marriage, and our humanity overall by promoting sexual sin as his main tactic for corrupting our souls and generations. The story of Dina is very important on many levels and will be very apropos and resonant for the times that we live in. Let's begin. There's so much new. I read now from the apocryphal book of Jasher or Yasher, chapter 33. And some time after Yaakov went away from the borders of the land, he came to the land of Shalem, that is the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. And he rested in front of the city. And he bought a parcel of the field, which was there from the children of Hamor, the people of the land, for five shekels. And Yaakov built himself a house there, and he pitched his tent there, and he made shelters for his cattle. Therefore he called the name of that place Sukkoth. And Yaakov remained in Sukkoth a year and six months. At that time, some of the women of the inhabitants of the land went to the city of Shechem to dance and rejoice with the daughters of the people of the city. And when they went out, then Rachel and Leah, the wives of Yaakov, with their families, also went to behold the rejoicing of the daughters of the city. And Dina, the daughter of Yaakov, also went along with them and saw the daughters of the city. And they remained there before these daughters, while all of the people of the city were standing by them to behold their rejoicings, and all the great people of the city were there. And Shechem, the son of Hamor, the prince of the land, was also standing there to see them. And Shechem beheld Dina, the daughter of Yaakov, sitting with her mother before the daughters of the city, and the young woman pleased him greatly. The scripture and history say that when Dina came with her mother to see the daughters of the Canaanites, the prince of the land named Shechem, son of Hamor, saw her and his soul longed for her immediately. He was captured and enraptured. And Which sought in, in turn to Canaan. capture her. And he rested in front of the city. Capture her heart. And he bought a parcel of capture her soul. Which was there from the children of Hamor, the people of the land, for five shekels. Obsessed and at Yaakov first built sight, seeing a house the purity of this young woman set and apart shelters for his cattle. from the women Therefore, of his he people. Called the name of that place he claimed her and seduced and Yaakov, her. And he asked his friends and his people there, saying, Whose daughter is that sitting among the women whom I do not know in this city? And they said to him, Surely this is the daughter of Yaakov, the son of Yitzhak, the Hebrew, who has dwelt in this city for some time. And when it was reported that the daughters of the land were going out to rejoice, she went with her mother and maidservants to sit among them, as you see. And Shechem beheld Dina, the daughter of Yaakov, and when he looked at her, his soul became fixed on Dina. And he sent and had her taken by force. And Dina came to the house of Shechem, and he seized her forcibly and lay with her and humbled her. And he loved her exceedingly and placed her in his house. And he asked his friends and his people. Here is saying, where the controversy Whose begins. Is that, sitting among a case the women, of whom semantics, you may say. It is important then to begin now to dive into the linguistic, the cultural, and historical Hebrew, context with which to root the, for some the proper understanding. And when it was reported that the daughters of the land story. were going out to rejoice.
It is important that a Hebrew people, we are able to read, to comprehend, and understand our stories, the stories of our God and our culture and our people with the proper understanding that our sacred language will lend us. I will first go over some words that refer to the form of forceful assault, ravishment, and violation that seem like the English word that has been translated as rape. The Hebrew word kabash means to subdue, bring into bondage or under subjugation, to force, forcing, to subjugate, to bring to subjection, to trample underfoot. And as I read that particular definition, I am reminded of Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God. Now, I admit it's been many years since I've read the novel. And as a writer, I have always been greatly inspired by and influenced by the writings of Zora Neale Hurston, Toni Morrison, James Baldwin. And recalling the book, I do understand that even as a writer, I reluctantly admit that the image and visual representations and adaptations often persist with us and stick with us more viscerally than the written word. This is also why as a people, we are so hypnotized and led astray by the image. And there's no accident that even in our language image is often linked to idolatry. The image of jealousy, the image of covetousness. Everything we see in the media controlled by the elite teaches us to covet, brings us to jealousy, brings us to a sense of not having enough, brings us to perpetual dissatisfaction and a desire to obtain more, bringing us to a sense of hustle that then becomes our God that rules us. Instead of being content and trusting our God to provide. But that's another story. That being said, the film version of Their Eyes Were Watching God although deplorable in many ways, often sticks with me. In one of the scenes, Janie, as a young woman played by Halle Berry, is coming into her season, coming into her follicular spring, coming into pubescence, into puberty, and understanding now her body and the world around her in a different way. And as she is blossoming into young womanhood, she begins to feel herself. She begins to understand the insidious process of attraction. And infatuated by a young boy around her age, in the film, her grandmother, played by Ruby D, <laughs> gently chastises her. And she tells her, a line that is very re relevant to this story of Dina. I will not let this man wipe his feet all over you. And I think of that when I read this particular definition of kabash, to trample underfoot. How many of us as women have unwittingly allowed a man to trample us, to wipe his feet on us, to walk all over us. And even in the older generations, we remember that women who were loose 
and casual sexually were called tramps. Being tramped upon, treaded upon, trampled underfoot. In their eyes were watching God, Janie's grandmother, it seems, was concerned just like Yaqob and Dina's brothers, concerned that she in her youthful naivety would be defiled, used, trampled upon, turned into a tramp, made common, discarded, slutted out, turned out. Going further, we understand the definition for kabash is used in Nehemiah 5 and 5, our daughters forced into bondage. Even more interestingly, a particular use of the word that is relevant to the controversy surrounding Dina and possibly relevant to the type of forced assault that is misattributed to Dina, in fact, is associated with Hadassah, Queen Esther. In Esther 7 and 8, the scripture says, will he, meaning Haman, assault or force the queen even in my own house? So here the emperor, the king, accosts Haman, who has in some form or another assaulted Esther. And he says, will you even dare to so boldly force my queen in my house? <laughs> so to see this word kabash used in this context, we see that this is a particular instance when it is applied to a scenario where a woman specifically is forced into a compromising situation. The root of the word kabash is related to the term to disregard and to conquer. Again, how many women having given ourselves to men of no honor have been conquered by them, subdued by them, and then disregarded and discarded? not even knowing their names and them not even knowing our names. To subdue and to dominate as the earth. This word is also used in better sheet, Genesis 1, to subdue the earth. And in many cultures and languages, woman is indeed likened to the earth. Our womb likened to the bowels of the earth into which seed is planted and also into which the blood of earth's children, our children, is spilled and is soaked in and absorbed. Another term associated with this word kabash again means to walk all over as in to walk all over her, to press, to squeeze, or to knead a body, specifically, as in a massage, <laughs> to attack or assault. This word we see is mostly used, however, in reference to dominion of land, subduing enemy territory, subjugating captives, or making slaves, making slaves of people who have been captured as the spoils of war. This is a useful transition into the next word that refers to the sort of ravishment and defilement that we often, through the English translations, associate with what has happened to Dina. Shagal means to violate, to ravish, or to lie with or within. In Deuteronomy 28 and 30, we see man will violate or lie with her. In Isaiah 13 and 16, it says their houses and their wives were ravished or lying within. We know that in war, as a military strategy and a tactic of conquering, the land and its subjects are ravished. 
we understand the term to rape and to pillage as used when referring even to warriors who have occupied or overtaken a land and its citizens. In Jeremiah 3 and 2, it says, where have you not been violated or lain with? And again, in Zechariah 14 and 2, the women ravished and the houses lain with. Now, of course, you can't lay with a house. You can lay within a house. And what's interesting is euphemistically, a woman in general, and more particularly a woman's womb, vulva or vagina, may indeed be likened to a house that a man lays within. Indeed, the word vagina comes from the etymological root of sheath. A sheath is the covering for one's sword. And we understand that a man's phallus is indeed likened to a sword or a staff or a rod. A woman may indeed be a home, a house, a sheath, a soft, sweet place for a man to lay his head in multiple meanings of the word. Even in the Hindu language, yoni, which is now so popularly proliferated throughout social media, the yoni means sacred space and is used to refer to the woman's reproductive organs. It is interesting that a woman's womb is home for a man and a child. A baby is formed within the womb as its first home. The waters of the womb warmly surrounding the baby that is formed. And indeed, perhaps man's enduring fascination and pursuit of woman is because man perpetually seeks to return to those warm waters of the womb from which he was born, to return to a state of softness and humility, a safe place of vulnerability even, returning to the comfort of the waters of the womb, his home. <laughs> I find it interesting that King David seduces Bathsheba and it could be proposed that her name refers to the house of Sheba. We understand then that his son Solomon in the Kebra Nagast, the histories of Josephus and other sources seems to have been enamored by the queen of Sheba Sheba, Empress Makeda. Isn't it interesting, the links between father and son, the house of Bathsheba, the house of Sheba, which is Bathsheba, was the conquest <laughs> of King David, who took her from her original husband, Uriah. And the son of that union was Solomon, who then, some say, was in love with the queen of Sheba. And we know a queen is the sovereign of a land, one who owns a land, the home that is Sheba, the house of the sovereign. Now, we must also understand the word patah means to allure, to allure, to entice, to flatter or persuade, to seduce. Patah also means to open. Even in slang, what do we say? I think it is interesting to note that even in our slang colloquialisms as the so-called black community, in our culture, when we speak of a man alluring or seducing a woman or vice versa, we say, you know, he got her open, he got her wide open, or she got her nose wide open for that man. 
Y'all know, y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> to be open means he has seduced or enthralled her or she has a crush on him, which is interesting because then that brings us back to Chagall. Um, excuse me. It brings us back to Kabash, which means to press. So why do we say that someone has a crush on someone? They are pressed. They are impressed by and pressed upon by that person. Interestingly enough, pata means not only to open, but to enlarge, which brings me to mind of Romeo and Juliet, where the nurse tells Juliet women grow by men. And indeed, women are enlarged by men. Literally, a man penetrates and expands her without getting too graphic. And indeed, by men and the planting of seed, a woman is enlarged through pregnancy and birth. Anyone who has given natural vaginal birth knows that there is a beautiful moment. Um, I have experienced natural births that have been absolutely blissful, um, pleasurable even. And there is always this precarious moment of transcendence between life and death. Having birthed four children naturally and vaginally, three of these births unassisted at home, I can definitely say each child, there's always a moment as a woman where you expand so much, you can't even imagine expanding further. You cannot imagine that your body can open any more than it is. And there is a true life and death moment. In every birth, there is a thrill even of, oh my gosh, you know, you really do feel that you are on the verge of death as we as women are the portal between life and death, bringing life and souls into this world. And it's a beautiful exchange. And again, women grow by men. And often with a righteous man, women grow intellectually and emotionally. Another interesting definition for patach is to make silly or to be silly. And indeed, when we have a crush on someone, doesn't infatuation make us silly as men and women? <laughs> And finally, it behooves us to go into the definition of the word zana. Zona refers to a prostitute or a harlot. This is used most memorably in the story of Tamar when she exacts her inheritance from Yehuda, from Judah also by clever and beguiling means. It's so interesting how throughout all of the stories of our patriarchs, there's this constant cycle of beguilement and deception and clever forms of the retribution of justice. But the word zana means to commit fornication, to be a harlot. And what's important here to distinguish is Kadesha, which has interesting links to Kodesh and Kadosh, also linked to not only holy and set apart, but also marriage, the bride being set apart, the wife being set apart. But interestingly enough, don't we love the juxtaposition and polarization of the wife and the whore? Indeed, in Jungian psychology, Carl Jung speaks often of the two Marys, Mother Mary and Mary Magdalene, um, and the Judeo-Christian, excuse me, the Judeo-Christian polarization of the mother and whore as these two facets of femininity to which some feel we are limited and some feel there's a beautiful spectrum between the woman, the wife, the mother, and the whore, where all of us at some point in our lives travel through these different, different definitions of womanhood. But 
the harlot here represented by Zana or Zona is not the same as Kadesha, which refers specifically to a temple prostitute or rather a courtesan or a paid whore. And temple prostitutes endure to this day. And without going into too much detail, even your favorite celebrities in a sense are temple prostitutes who literally serve idols and demons and are sex trafficked um, even as spies to um, elite figures of other nations in very interesting ways. So the ritual and the political are always intertwined and nothing and no one is ever merely entertainment or an entertainer. But that's another story. The temple prostitutes were women who were either sold as slaves, even as children trafficked See, nothing, nothing is new under the sun. Child trafficking nowadays is often linked to ritual sacrifice and prostitution to this very day. Um, this is also another form of sacrificing your children to Molech, which is spoken about repeatedly throughout scripture. Um, but sex trafficking um, is one form of temple prostitution where all over the world, even to this day, nothing has changed. Children are sold into slavery, sex slavery, sold into ritual slavery to literally channel demons or deities. Young girls now in Ghana in the Trotoski tradition are kidnapped or sold as children, raped by priests and groomed to be seductresses. They grow up and are adorned with waist beads and cowrie shells and become trained seductresses. And through ritual, they literally channel demons, marine kingdom spirits, Mamiwata, Oshun, Yemonja, and different deities. And those in the Caribbean and in Africa are very familiar with this phenomenon and very familiar with the, seduc the seduction of marine kingdom spirits and the seductresses that are often one and the same with prostitutes. So I implore men to be very careful. If you have lain down with a prostitute, even if you think she's just, you know, someone that you, you know, you may have just paid for a good time, many of them I would say all of them are in fact witches. And even if they are not conscious and deliberate in their own witchcraft themselves, indeed, they are possessed by demons of lust and principalities. So keep that in mind. But here in specific reference to Dina and even to Tamar, Zana, the harlot, is not a paid prostitute or a temple prostitute per se. She is rather a woman of folly, a woman who dishonors herself and disrespects her father's house, culture, and God, especially by agreeing to lay down casually with men of no honor or the uncircumcised pagans. So we must understand that when one is objectified, one is dehumanized. Even strippers and prostitutes are dehumanized. They are seen as objects rather than women. They are seen as a means to the end of fulfilling a sexual desire rather than as human beings. Objectification through lust and pornographic aspiration is dehumanization of the highest and most sordid degree. And so it also takes a degree of dehumanization for a man to rape a woman, to forcefully rape a woman. One must not be able to comprehend her humanity. So that's something to think about. 
we must keep these definitions in mind firmly. While now I transition to the words that are actually used, specifically in reference to Dina. Context is key. We understand that in scripture, the words specifically referring to what Shechem did to or with Dina are not any of the words that I just outlined, in fact. In Genesis 34 and 2, and when he saw her, Shechem, son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, he took her and lay with her and violated her. Took her, lay with her, and violated her are three Hebrew words that I will now delineate and distinguish. Lachach, Lachach. Strong's 3947 is the word that is used for he took her. And it means to take, to accept, to bring, one who has brought, to buy, to capture, to carry. And even in Nigerian slang, culturally, when a man carries a woman, that means he has taken her as his beloved, as his lover, even as his wife. So that's an interesting cultural allusion to this very term. Lachach, lachach also means to exact from, to find, flashing, which is very interesting, to get, to keep, to marry, to obtain, to place, to procure, to put. And indeed a man who finds a woman and claims a woman puts or places her doesn't he? He names her and claims her. He places her somewhere in his life. He gives her a role. He places her in his house, ideally, which indeed Shechem did. The scripture is clear that he took her and placed her in his house. The word also means to raise, to receive, and to seize. Now, often we think in English terms that the word seize means some sort of violent snatching. But indeed, in more poetic classical literature, you can see writers will even say, he was seized with passion, to be seized with ecstasy, to be seized with emotion. This is why we have to be a literate literary people. To be seized or to seize also means to proudly and triumphantly claim. And doesn't any woman desire deeply to be proudly and triumphantly claimed by a man? To be claimed without ambiguity. Proud to claim who he is captured by and seducing seeks to capture her heart in kind. The word finally also means to select, to choose. And doesn't every woman wanna be chosen despite the proliferation of the pick me stigma on social media? We all desire to be chosen, to be claimed, to be picked unambiguously. The word also means to supply, to use, or to win. And don't we say in courtship, may the best man win. The word shakab, shakab is the word used to refer to him lying with her. Shakab Strong's 7901 means to lie down, to sleep in, to lie with, or he lay with. Some interesting scriptural references from Better Sheet include Genesis 30 and 16, when Reuben finds Leah's mandrakes and Rachel negotiates the deal that Yaakov will lie with her that night. 
in Genesis 35 and 22, Reuben lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. Genesis 39 and 7, Potiphar's wife said to Joseph, lie with me. Exodus 22 and 19 implores us that there is severe punishment for the abomination of whoever lies with an animal. Genesis 28 and 11, Jacob, when he is at the gate and has the dream of the ladder, he lied down in that place to sleep. Genesis 26 and 10, Abimelech says to Abraham, when he has deceived him concerning his, his spouse, his sister, his spouse, Sarai, I might have easily lain with your wife. And Genesis 19 and 35, when Lot is beguiled by his daughters, he perceived that when his daughter lay down or arose. To be lain with, referring specifically sexually to a woman. The word also means to lay down for rest, for sexual connection, or the rest or sleep of the deceased, or to rest in a lodging place. Finally, the word anach, anach, ana, Strong 6031, to be bowed down, afflicted, humbled, oppressed, to be occupied with or occupied by, to be lowly or submissive, to be put down, to become low, to be mishandled by imprisonment in war, to be enslaved, as the word is used throughout Shemoth or Exodus. More specifically, in Genesis 34 and 2, this word refers to being humbled by cohabitation. And I find that greatly interesting because nowadays we see so many couples cohabitating without legal marriage. That is a humbling and a devaluing because then a woman plays a wife without having the rights of a wife. There are many scriptures in which this word is used. Also in Deuteronomy 21 and 14 and Deuteronomy 22 and 24, this word is used to refer to the woman humbled, humbled by a man without marriage and the man that has to pay the bride price to her father for having taken her. The word also can refer to being afflicted as a form of discipline and being humbled by fasting as well as to be treated harshly, as the word is used in reference to Sarah's treating Hagar harshly or afflicting her. So we wonder, now that we understand the actual words that were used, was it indeed rape or seduction? Dina was irrefutably defiled, humbled, debased, and made common. He took her as a man takes a wife, yet without the covenant commitment legitimized by a dowry and a bride price. Economic compensation or financial security given to a woman as a form of covering. A dowry is a gift of respect. It's not buying a woman as a prostitute, as many feminists believe, that a dowry is the case of a father selling his daughter as if she has no right or say. A dowry is a gift of respect, acknowledging the woman's value and deserving of honor for her virtue. A bride price is a gift of respect to her family in gratitude for the sacrifices made to shape her and raise her as a woman of honor and value i.e. a return on investment, their investment as parents into her etiquette and education. So if anything happens to the husband, like a form of insurance, she is covered and provided for still and able to support herself or be supported. 
So therefore, Shechem, by not honoring her in marriage first before he lay with her, could have easily discarded her and left her uncovered and uninsured. <laughs> His defilement then becomes a social family matter for civil court, so to speak, as one would go to civil court over an argument for property or assets or alimony or support owed a wife that was denied. This is in stark contrast to viewing it as a forcible harmful act, a criminal matter for the judicial court system. He humbled her, offending her family because he insulted her virtue, making her common. So I think we must understand that, yes, it is quite clear she was devalued, debased, and defiled. But it can hardly be said by the words of our God. Knowing our God is so meticulous in every single word, every aleph and tav that is in our scripture. It cannot be said that she was forcibly attacked and raped. Although yes, she was raped in the sense that her innocence and purity and sacredness were stolen, which More Avdiel bin Levi so beautifully illustrated in his debate with Chomo Polite. And I continue. And they came and told the thing to Yaakov. And when Yaakov heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter Dina, Yaakov sent 12 of his servants to fetch Dina from the house of Shechem. And they went and came to the house of Shechem to take Dina away from there. And when they came, Shechem went out to them with his men and drove them from his house, and he would not permit them to come before Dina. But Shechem was sitting with Dina, kissing and embracing her before their eyes. And the servants of Yaakov came back and told him, saying, When we came, he and his men drove us away, and thus Shechem did to Dina before our eyes. And Yaakov knew, moreover, that Shechem had defiled his daughter, but he said nothing. And his sons were feeding his cattle in the field, and Yaakov remained silent until their return. And they came and told In the Targum Yerushalayim, or the Targum Pseudo-Jonathan, it says, It will not be fit to be said in the congregation of Yisrael, in their house of instruction, that the uncircumcised polluted the virgin and the worshipers of idols, the daughter of Yaakov. But it is fit that it be said in the congregations of Yisrael and in their house of instruction that the uncircumcised were put to death for the sake of the virgin and the worshipers of idols because they had defiled Dina, the daughter of Yaakov. And Shechem bar Hamor will not boast in his heart and say, as a woman who hath no man to avenge her injury, so hath Dina, the daughter of Yaakov, been made. And they said, as an impure woman and an outcast, would he have accounted our sister. It is important to realize that the story of Dina is a story of redemption. It's a story of justice through retribution. It's a story of a woman being defended and protected even when she may have been complicit in her own degradation by not protecting herself, by foolishly and recklessly perhaps agreeing to be seduced and defiled by a man who did not honor her. So many of us as women have experienced this, a man who promises marriage, oh, you know, we already married, you already wifey. You know, we we you lay down with these men and live together in houses with them without them honoring us in contractual, legal, and spiritual covenant, giving us the rights to inheritance, the rights to protection as a wife. We play the housewife, the wifey, without the rights of a wife. And so, yes, love or infatuation rather, makes us do silly things. 
And we may be complicit in our own degradation. But isn't it beautiful that whether she agreed to stay with Shechem or not, her brothers valiantly defended her. The Canaanites, who otherwise would not have been introduced to the righteous, set apart ways and customs of the Hebrews and their God, were introduced to the covenant through circumcision, albeit in an aggressive way, in defense of a virgin's honor, to show them you don't just take women without honoring their virtue. Also, Dina was protected zealously by her brothers who took impassioned action, not without deliberation, mind you, as they did sit and counsel and did not simply act rashly and immediately, although they acted cleverly with guile. The fact that Hamor and Shechem were plotting to take Jacob's riches by having him settle in their land and marry their women was also another reason the attack was justified. In the book of Jasher, it is clear, Chabor and Shechem were plotting to kill them, were plotting to steal their wealth and absorb them by marrying their daughters into the land so that the identity of God's righteous people would literally be erased. Yah forbid. Also, Yah's brilliance in righteous judgment upon the wicked Canaanites through the arm of Simeon and Levi is this. Because Shechem weaponized his sexuality, virility, and masculine strength to humble Dina, her brothers cleverly conspired to weaponize the humbling of his sexuality, virility, and masculine strength by the circumcision, cutting and diminishing his pride. Thus, her brothers avenged her dishonor in equal measure as she was humbled sexually. He was humbled sexually. Because as the Targum Jerusalem says, it shall not be said he violated her. It shall not be said he made her common. It shall not be said he turned her out. It shall not be said he slutted her out as a woman with no man to avenge her. So I believe we should give justice to Dina, put some respect on her name, <laughs> put some respect on her name. And yes, again, we understand that just like many of us women, she was complicit in her own dishonoring. She was defiled, but she was not dehumanized. She was not dehumanized as a rape victim. She was not dehumanized as an objectified object of lust, just discarded and thrown away. I believe that Shechem may have indeed believed he truly loved her. And that probably was a soul tie. More of an obsession than real love, perhaps. Nonetheless, it is beautiful that Yah's justice came forth. And indeed, even to Simeon and Levi, there are scriptures that show that Though their actions brought displeasure even to Yaakov, there was a divine justice retributed to them as well in their, in their future descendants. So thank you for viewing this presentation. I honor the time that you have spent and I hope that it has been edifying to you. And here are some ways to get in touch with me. Instagram, Hadara Womb Care. Facebook, Chawa Hadassah. And of course, my website, hadarabeautyblissbirth.com. Shalom, shalom.